Hey, everybody. This is Mario Dennis, your host with the Keeping It Real Estate podcast. And today I have my good friend, Vic DeVore with DeVore Designs. How are you doing, Vic? I'm doing very well, Mario. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, this is going to sound awesome because Vic just told me he used to be on the radio. <laughs> so this is not his first time. One of the first jobs that I had in Orlando was actually working for Clear Channel Radio. And you would do what? The weather, you said, right? I was doing the traffic. So the I, traffic. Would, I would get to look at all the traffic cameras along I-4 and see what a nightmare it is and tell everybody that was driving in their car trying to get home how bad it was. <laughs> so you were delivering bad news 99% of the time. Yeah. In Orlando traffic, you're never delivering good news. It's rare. Yes. And that was before the I-4 Ultimate project. Can you imagine now? Yeah, I couldn't imagine, actually. I just saw a statistic yesterday that there's been 167 people that hit something because of the construction on I-4 since the I-4 Ultimate project started that resulted in an insurance claim. 167. Wow. wow. That's crazy. Yeah, that's that's. there's a lot going on. I mean, that's... The, between, the crazy part is people are driving three miles an hour, nine out of yeah, ten times. So if you're too. hitting something, it's got to be... I don't, I don't even understand how that happens, but anyways... <laughs> For those who don't know, you are a photographer. Correct. So DeVore Design um, is a company that I started in 2000, officially in 2015. And um, it's, we, we provide real estate photography. So I initially started all on my own. I, it, it was sort of, I, I was at a pivotal point in my, uh, in my career, in my life, really, um, coming out of another business that had failed. I had some camera gear. I had the, uh, I've always had in, um, I've always enjoyed photography and digital media in general. So I started to just learn about real estate photography, learn what realtors wanted, learn what they needed, sort of combine my previous experience with digital marketing into the business as to what I provided and how I kind of branded my own business and we've grown, we have 17 people on staff now. So wow, we've grown a lot. Uh, and it's a very steep curve of growth and it's difficult because photography media in general, we can all look at one photo and each person has a different opinion or a different idea as to what, you know, yeah, that looks good. No, that, you know, the colors, we all see things differently. So, I had kind of a style that I was shooting and, and I learned that style based on the people that, um, that I was looking at in California, in New York. So I tried to adapt those styles cause I thought they looked really good here in Orlando. And I think that's what helped my success was people saw what I was doing and they, uh, they, they liked that. So eventually I got to a point where I either had to, it, it, it was one of those pivotal points where, what do I do? I'm getting too much business and people are waiting too long to book me because I was doing everything myself. So do I start to hire people? If I hire people, how do I make sure that the media is going to be consistent with what I've been providing? It was a real challenge. I talked to different people within the real estate industry, different people within the photography industry, and um, decided to go down a path of growth. And, uh, and I think we've been pretty successful with it since then. And, you know, the, my, my real background, again, so even before radio, it's digital marketing, straight out of high school. I grew up in Fort Lauderdale. I was born down there, moved up here in uh, 99, and... Digital marketing is what I started doing right out of high school. I didn't go to college. I had, I was a terrible student and, uh, but I enjoyed digital marketing. I was a computer geek before it was cool to be a computer geek. <laughs> is it cool? <laughs> I think it's cool now, <laughs> <laughs> but it was something that I really enjoyed. I had a passion for it and I, I really did, um, I, I, I did as much on the digital marketing side as I could and then I had this sudden desire to get into radio. So I went to broadcasting school, which at the end of the day was actually a really great experience. The, my experience in radio 
it it kind of showed me another side of broadcast media. So I had some digital marketing experience from the late 90s into the early 2000s. Then I got into radio. And then I, the radio industry, I, I wasn't comfortable with, uh, you know, I wasn't comfortable with where I was at. And in radio, you really have to move around a lot to, to continue to move up and mm-hmm. up. And I wasn't prepared to do that. So you weren't prepared to move to the middle of nowhere over and over and over. Yeah. It, it, I have friends that did it and they were successful with it, but I wasn't willing to do that. So I ended up, um, taking my digital marketing skills, created another business that, um, uh, basically doing engravable gifts online. It was successful. We did it for several years. We, we did it for, I think about five or six years, actually. Eventually the, um, competition just, it was more than I could. We got to the point where we were spending, um, a significant amount in, in advertising just to maintain the revenue that we were maintaining. And it got to the point where the, the, uh, we, we just, we ended up going bankrupt. Yeah. And that was the real, that was a, a significant time, um, for my wife and I, for our family that, uh, we didn't know what we were going to do. This was in about 2012 or so, you know, we, everything had been pretty consistent. And then now we had this challenge to figure out what are we going to do? Um, I had some of the, the camera gear left over from, uh, from that business. And my father bought me a drone and that drone kind of was like a light bulb because I looked at what people were doing with drones well, real estate, certainly. When consumer drones first came out, real estate photography, that's really what people were using it for. So I thought, well, let me see if I can learn real estate photography, learn the, the business, and, and that's what I did. As the business grew and I met more people, um, there's a, a very successful photographer in Texas named David Slaughter. And I would communicate with him. He gave me a lot of feedback. And he was the one that kind of said, you've got to either scale or become a boutique. So if I'm going to be a boutique, then that means I'm going to have higher prices. You're basically hiring me. But the problem was I polled our customers at the time to find out what was most important to them. The third thing that was most important was turnaround time. The second thing that was most important was photo quality. The number one thing that our customers wanted was availability. So that was really that point when I decided instead of just me doing everything, I need to provide availability. That's what my customers want. That seems to be what, what agents want. So that's when we really grew. And part of that growth was creating media standards because again, so if we're doing a, um, if, if I'm taking photos and I have five other people taking photos, how can I make sure that we're going to have consistency? So I legitimately created a media standards guide that has all of the different angles and it's, it's almost 50 pages, but what it does is it provides consistency. It provides me a way to manage our photographers. It, we can manage expectations. Um, it's really an awesome tool to have that kind of consistency. I'm very procedural based. Right. Um, I thought it was funny. Kathy Hereford was on your show and she, she thinks that she's anti-business and you know, she, but the truth is she's hyper focused. Oh, you saw when I pushed back on that because that was not, I noticed that. Yeah. Yeah. She's, she's so focused. She has a very clear vision and she executes that vision with every transaction she's involved with. So whether she realizes it or not, you and I and everybody else sees. Obviously. Exactly. And, that, yes. and that's the, the, a huge part of her success. And she's been a longtime customer of ours, too. It's been fantastic seeing the, the growth that she had just in her first year. Yeah. I think, you know, consistency is certainly important when you're growing your business because you're probably a referral more than anything. People Absolutely. are referring you, you know, a colleague refers you to someone else. And the consistency is important because if I look at Susie's listings and I see her pictures and I hire you, 
I expect that. So if you send another photographer, I don't really care. I still expect the thing that, that brought me to you. So that consistency is definitely important. But part of the reason why I think availability is so important for agents is because it's the thing that lacks the most. So that which we don't have becomes most important. And with the photography, the tricky part is when we go to a listing appointment, it's about like, get the listing signed today. Well, part of the reason we want to get the listing signed or part of the tools that we want to use to get that listing signed right away is like, hey, listen, I can have a photographer here tomorrow, which is a very different speech to give someone than telling them, hey, sign the listing agreement and then I'm going to call and figure out when they're next available and I'll I'll let you know tomorrow which day they'll be able to come back. So it's just such like a deflating thing. It's like going to the dealership because you want to test drive, you know, the white Acura and you go see the white Acura and they're like, eh, we don't have the white Acura, but we have a red Honda and you are like, Ugh, it's kind of deflating, you know? Exactly. You know, but we'll get a white Acura next week. You'll already have a car by next week. You're not going to wait. Um, so that's, I think, why the availability becomes so important in our business, because it's really a tool that we use um, in the listing presentation as well. Yeah, absolutely. And that's something that we that I've learned, too, about the business is that you guys, when you are um, doing a listing presentation, you're promising top notch media. You're promising certain things that we have to deliver. And to, to be able to deliver it fast, of course, is is a big part of that uh, equation. Of course. And. The other part of it is a lot of agents are not doing it. So not only do we promise, you know, we're delivering great quality media, but we are using that as a value proposition to get hired to sell this house. Right. Because if I'm able to bring, you know, your media standards and show someone what it's going to, what their house is going to look like up front, it's going to give me an edge because now there's no unknown because the world for the word professional photography it's weird <laughs> i know it's so squarely right it's a moving target it is a moving target you know because um, before real estate for a long time i was involved in auto racing and you know worked in companies that built race cars and so forth and one of the things that i used to do is i used to go with the race team to races to document them and do pictures so i was the photographer for the team but i remember um a friend of mine at the time who was a like headshot photographer, right. you know, he's like, Hey, never call yourself a photographer until you make a living through the camera. And I'm like, well, I'm certainly not doing that. So I'm not a photographer, but you know, this whole idea of the professional photographer is like you said, it's a moving target. It's, you know, it's sometimes the agent's daughter that just got a DSLR for Christmas. That's, that's the professional photographer. Yeah. And so, you know, people are listening to three listing agents and they all say they bring professional photography. Well, if only one of those people brings your standards of media and shows them what their house is going to look like, that is definitely going to stand out versus the rest. Right. Yeah. And I, you know, you mentioned that too, in terms of, uh, we're focused on real estate photography. We don't do headshot photography. We don't do um, automotive photography. We do anything that's related to architecture. So we do apartment complexes. Of course, we do vacation properties, but we do not do uh, headshots, portraits. And why? Because it's different. It's a different style of editing. It's a different style of photography. Um, doesn't mean that our photographers can't do it. it does, it's just not something that DeVore Design is hyper-focused on. And that's what I think that's another one of the things that makes DeVore Design different from other photographers. And we've, there's so many uh, very talented colleagues in Orlando in the industry. Matter of fact, it's very uh, humbling because sometimes on the Facebook groups, a uh, realtor will ask for a referral. There might be 10, 15 different people. And I'm I'm just glad if we get one referral. Right. Um, well, you normally get like, if there's 10, you get seven. So well, <laughs> no need to be that humble. <laughs> but I will say, I mean, there's still very talented photographers. You guys are doing a ton of volume. We so are. by now, if Central Florida, if someone doesn't know the board designs, they've been living under a rock or they've never <laughs> listed a house. That's the only two choices. Today is our, and it's kind of cool to be here to share this, but today is the, we've, had the um we never had as much volume as we've had today we have 28 shoots today 28 shoots in one day in one day fuck <laughs> 
That's a lot of work. And that's all in the Metro Orlando area. Wow. Um, we had a photographer in Tampa and he recently retired and I haven't been able to find the right fit over there. We didn't do a ton of business there. My focus has still been here. We have started to do more business in Volusia County, Daytona, New Smyrna. So I've been focused out there a little bit more than I have on the West Coast. But plus it's easier. That market is a lot easier. It's, it's more within arm's reach than Tampa per se. I really like the hyper-focused approach that you have to real estate photography. Because one of the things that I don't like is when people feel like they have to put their hands on every pie to be able to make a living. Like there's so many transactions taking place that there's enough volume for you to specialize on your just real estate. But then to your point, there's a lot of people that are like real estate photographers slash wedding photographers slash portraits slash, you know, you become like, you know, jack of all trades, master of none. And that's a really bad thing because for real estate, you really need a master right now. Like if you're, if you really want to set yourself apart with your pictures, with your media, when you get a new listing, you got to get someone that's really, really good at it because like to your point, you know, you're looking at what photographers are doing in different markets, what might be new in the industry. You're talking to photographers in other parts of the country. And that's a very different thing than just going and shooting, editing and delivering. Correct. A very different thing. You're taking that extra step, like, you know, the sort of the artist view to it to see what other people are doing and innovate with it and try to keep up with the, um, with with the new trends you know because i talked about this with tara moore and it's funny people laugh at me sometimes because i you know i'm sort of an advocate of um you know i'm not a fan of the i buyers in the way they operate right now mm -hmm. i'm not a fan of the big brokerage model that takes a lot of money from the agents you know there's a lot of things that i'm very outspoken about but one of the things is like people say well you you know you can't change that you can't change it. Well, that's that, that's not gonna, never going to change. And I'm like, well, is it? And the example is always photography because in 2011, 2012, the majority of listings did not have professional photography. Nowadays, you're a buffoon if you don't have professional photography. So obviously, the industry does recognize when there is a change that needs to take place to better the product that we put out there and the industry will, you know, everyone in the industry falls in line. And photography is that way. And then it became the twilight photography, then everybody fell in line with that. And then it became the drone and then everybody fell in line with that. Then and now is the virtual stage in which I still don't like, but then everybody's falling in line with that. Um, and so photography has been such an amazing thing in real estate because it's been the one thing that we can point to, to say, we have the capacity to get better and produce a better product for our customers consistently. And the way that happens is by having people like you that are looking at the trends elsewhere and bringing them to central Florida. Yeah, absolutely. So last year, there was, uh, we, we started to kind of formulate some new services. And one of those services was inspired by a compass agent uh, up in New York City. And he's on camera for all of his listings. He's on camera. He's got a great on camera presence. But we formulated a production style to put agents on camera. And the best part about that particular formula is it's uh, it's something that we can put on Zillow. So all the videos that we produce, we upload to Zillow and then it becomes part of the Zillow walkthrough video. So, you know, having you on camera in that video on Zillow, it gets a tremendous uh, amount of exposure. Well, it's huge because it gives the, that agent the opportunity to do something that they never had the opportunity to do before, which is connect with a perfect stranger on a personal level. You can't do that otherwise. You're connecting with a personal stranger before they ever picked up the phone. That's crazy. Yeah, on a very local level, too, because I know in my neighborhood, anytime something comes up, I usually look at it, see what, you know, see what it looks like inside. Right. And I usually look at it on Zillow. Right. So it's, uh, it's a good opportunity for agents to enhance their brand exposure. Uh, and, and, of course, you can share the video on social media. You can share it through your email list. Can't put it on the MLS, unfortunately, because of the agent branding. Because we're still in the 1820s in yeah. some respects of our industry. So what are your thoughts on branding and MLS media? I, I'd love to know what you think about that. Um, I think the rules are there for a reason. And I think it's important to be nuanced with all of this. 
because I don't think these are decisions that were made by someone at one point in a very short time. I think these decisions that um, leave us with the industry that we have today and the rules that we have today are the evolution of many, many different things that took place to get to this point. I don't disagree with the rules about branding in the MLS in regards to like having your sign on the picture or having pictures that are branded with the agent's information. Like, I don't think that's okay. I don't think that's okay because I think it, it, I think it puts the agent front and center where the house should be front and center. It distracts from the property. It distracts from the property. And so I think the best chance that that seller of that house has to sell that home needs to be needs to rely on the agent doing the best possible job at marketing that property to the best of that property's abilities. And so when you have a lot branded marketing material, it can go one or two ways. It could be like, oh my God, we love Kathy and she's the listing agent for the house. Let me call her right now. It could go that way. Or it could be like, hey, we fucking hate Mario and we would have bought this house had it been anyone else but Mario listing it. Right. And so, you know, I, I think the marketing rules are there for good reason. And I think sometimes I feel like we we want to just like, you know, tip over the apple cart and, you know, redo everything. But I think the rules are there for a good reason. I think... I think there should be some leeway with some of this stuff. I think, I wish the MLS was easier to incorporate things like YouTube links into it so that you yeah. can have a different type of media available um, or even just develop a partnership with them. Uh, because um, after after Google, YouTube is now the second most search search engine. So if we're going to be in, in a business where we're competing with companies, you know, you know, like Zillow, Realtor.com or whatever for the attention of the consumer, I think it would probably be a good way for good thing for the board or for the National Association of Realtors to make an agreement with YouTube so that we can upload to YouTube and have, you know, people be able to see the media in that way so they can use another search engine for it. And, you know, I think it's kind of, interesting because one of the things that's happened to me in a personal level is now when I have to search for something I don't I don't always think for the most efficient way to search for that thing I sometimes think for the least intrusive way to search for that thing for example I've been bent in finding a protein powder that doesn't have sucralose I know this is very trivial and very like we're <laughs> off into the weeds, but just very few, specific. Yeah. But, you know, they sell all these protein pow powders with, you know, touted as health, healthy products, but then they're loaded with sucralose, which, you know, everyone has their thoughts on it. I don't want it in my body if I can avoid it. So, but I know if I do a search on Google, I'm going to get destroyed with ads oh, after yeah. that. Yeah. My inbox is going to get full. My Facebook feed's going to be nothing but protein powders. So, I, like, it's almost like it's worth going to the library and searching it there, you know, because I don't, I don't want to get bombarded with stuff. And so I look for a, the least intrusive way to search for it. And I think likewise, a lot of people that are going to be, that are kicking tires, if you will, looking at homes like you would on, you know, the home in your neighborhood or whatever, they're probably going to avoid going to websites like Zillow or Realtor.com in the future because... It's too much. It's just too much. Like I own a few different properties and I get multiple emails for m each one of my properties every single week telling me about the market, telling me about wh what it's doing. And I'm in real estate and I'm a real estate junkie. I love what I do. I love real estate. I love the market. I love the numbers. That's, that's my thing. So I can't imagine someone that doesn't have the interest that I have on it receiving three to four to five emails a month about the same thing over and over again. So I think, you know, one of the things that we could do is just that, you know, if, if you want to put a marketed video, let's do that on a, something like YouTube and maybe the board could create an agreement with a company like YouTube to be able to make that happen. So I think that's, that's a good change. Um, branded media after that, I think, listen, I think nowadays there, the, the the branded part of the media is going to be on Facebook. A lot of people right. are, even though Zillow doesn't allow branded pictures on Zillow, 
a lot of people are finding a way to kind of, you know, kind of like deal with that in clever ways to still have some kind of branding, you know, within the pictures, like whether it's the screen on the TV, you know, that they, you know, yeah. put like the name of the company or right. whatever. So the people are getting clever about it. Um, so I don't really think branding media and MLS would help us in any way right now. The one thing you mentioned video, I mean, that's probably, I think video has evolved so much in, in a really short amount of time, even from when I first got into the business, when I first got into this business, video was a big part of my, uh, part of, part of my business model. But in the last year, I would say two years on the long side, it has evolved. Everybody understands video. They know how to use video. You can distribute video very easily and there's an appetite for video especially when HGTV is the second or third most watched network, we're in real estate, we're in real estate media. So we're providing something that people legitimately have an appetite for. That's one thing I would love to see the MLS uh, come up with some kind of, like you said, some kind of framework for, uh, for media, whether it's branded or not, just for video content to be part of that regular listing when you upload the photos upload a video yeah and and someone listening to this needs to understand one thing part of the reason why you've been so successful at your business is because you took the photographer hat off years ago and you're still a photographer i'm not saying you're not but you understood that being a photographer was not going to cut the mustard in the future and that you were going to have to incorporate video and there's going to be a point where video is going to be mainstream and everyone's going to be able to do it at a pretty decently high quality. Yeah. And that's why you're evolving into sort of like a media consulting company. You're now providing tools to listing agents to help them get the listing. That's a different business than being a photographer altogether. But it's the thing that really sets you guys apart that I think listing agents are looking at what you guys do and they can see the evolution of your business and they can see how you continuously you know take things out of their toolbox and put some other things in that toolbox and then send the listing agents to get the listing so that's that's probably one of the things that sets you guys apart a lot for sure yeah and on the video side we're actually i'm um, collaborating with our photographers either next week or the week after and we're coming up with new video services that uh you know, the, the real estate market generally slows down a little bit for us uh, as we get into the winter months. So we're going to create some different video uh, products that will enable agents to get more exposure. Um, and we're, we're developing all of this, you know, with a formula in mind. And the formula is going to, it, it's going to be easy for us. It's going to be uh, less expensive. So it's something that we can replicate, but it's also part of the formula is the effectiveness of what it is that we're going to provide. Because I have a background in digital marketing, I don't want to provide something just because I want to sell something. I want to sell something that's actually going to be effective and provide results for our customers. Um, and, the, and on the video side, you've got Instagram videos. Instagram is a little bit different than, you know, you've got the 60 second limit depending on how you upload it. Um, so there's certain things there that we're just, we're going to actually automatically start allowing customers to export their media for Instagram. So we'll have that option. So there's not going to have to be any, um, kind of conversions or anything that have to take place. Uh, but we're seeing, you know, we're seeing all of this taking place. And again, it's evolving very, very quickly. It is. And the other thing that it seems to be changing quickly is the algorithms. Do you have any concerns about that? Well, so algorithms, one of the things that um, I was surprised to learn about uh, is the search algorithm within Zillow and the, the how many megapixels your photos are in Zillow has an impact on where a property will place in the search results, whether there's a video, whether there's a 3D tour. Um, so, and then on the social side, I think the algorithms are always going to favor people that are paying that pay to play concept is it's, it's certainly going to, they're, they're here to make money. I mean, those platforms are. Yeah. The interesting thing is that I think the only caveat to that is they're always going to favor the thing 
that is most profitable to them. Yes, you're right. And sometimes that's not you being a paying customer. And so that's one thing with the algorithm algorithms that gets really tricky because they want to they want to um spread the information that's going to get the most reactions and keep people engaged. That's yep. sort of the known um we we know very little because it's all very secretive. This is not open source. Um you know, but for the most part, we can all agree that that's what they do. They're trying to get people to see the thing that's going to keep coming back. That's why they, like Facebook specifically, their algorithm, that's why they favor conflict over happy stuff. Mm -hmm. Because you see a happy video and you'll be like, oh, that was sweet. And you may tag your wife, but, you know, you see something that totally enrages you and you share and you're like, fuck this, blah, 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 blah. And then it keeps coming back every time somebody replies, you're like, ah, oh, no, Blah, blah, blah. you respond to that <laughs> and then it's like that dopamine right like the likes the, the all the emotions like every time somebody responds that's a dopamine hit yeah um, so they know that and they that's why they keep that content up front so what i notice sometimes is i'll have a listing that's it might be an interesting listing you know whether because of the price point whether the house is you know it's a little particular or whatever and I'll do a sponsor post with, um, I always, I've always done the broad criteria thing because it always kind of seemed a little stinky to me to be like, you know, the thing that people were doing before. Like, I only want to share this with doctors. I only want like, yeah, I'm getting a little weird here. Like I don't, A, I don't really have the time to go through all of this and pretend like I know what I'm doing. So I'm just going to do a broad. So I, it's always a dollar amount and a days for me. And so the listings that would be like, you know, that were particular for, for whatever reason, they would get two, three, four, five times the exposure than they would like the same exact listing in the same exact area with the same exact budget. And it's not because people were sharing it more. It was evidently that something picked up, something in the algorithm picked up this listing and said, people are going to react to this thing. People are going to share this thing. They're going to send it to their friend or whatever. And it, it got all this extra exposure. So it's interesting how they manipulate that stuff for sure. Yeah. Algorithmically kind of, um, predicting what is going to be popular, what's going to have the most interaction. Yeah. Well, so I, I don't know if people know this, but I, I was able to grab a screenshot the other day on my computer because my internet died. The second I up, I went into Facebook and the internet cut off and it just froze. You know, you see all the, where the picture should go. You don't see the picture, but you see like the little icon broken of the picture and you see like a, the little title of it mm -hmm. next to it. And it was pictures of my wife and I in vacation with our daughter. And the pictures were like, the, the titles were like baby beach bucket. Oh, I see. So they it was like it. adult male hat fishing pole. So they have the technology to be able to read the pictures and catalog them based on what is in that picture. I don't know that many people are aware of that, but I think that's part of what they're using for the algorithms that they know that, you know, uh, specific shapes, specific things inside houses are get people to respond in a certain way. And I know someone's listening to this going like, oh my God, you're such a conspiracy theory. This is actually 2013 technology we're talking about here is not 2019 technology we're talking about. Um, so I think that favors the algorithms a lot uh, because they are able to recognize what is being a picture used to be just a box. Like the, the systems didn't have a way to read what was in there, but now that's all read and catalog. Yeah. They can, they can use object recognition to see exactly what's in a, in a photo they're doing the same thing now. YouTube does it in on the video side. They can even take what you say in a video. That becomes part of the search engine algorithm for YouTube.com. Yes. And so on a similar case with a podcast, I've done a, obviously a few shows with iBuyers. And I did one and it wasn't getting any exposure. No views, no likes, no nothing. And I'm like, what happened here? And so Matt Wheatley is very good. Matthew Wheatley, he's yeah. very good with um, with Facebook. So I showed him, he's like, are you sure? Same thing. And I'm like, yeah. So I showed him both. And he's like, that's kind of weird. It's almost like, it's almost like a shadow band or like, you know, being suppressed. But that's exactly what it is. I guarantee you, I said something on that video 
that was picked up as like, eh, we don't really need to be hearing this guy say this, so we're just going to throw it into the back burner. Um, so it does happen very often, which I think that's the that's the shady thing with the sponsor posts. Yeah, not knowing exactly what what's really happening. When I pay you, what, what's happening there? What's happening in the back end? Are you really going to do all these views that you tell me you, you're going to do? Like, what what are we doing here? It's one of those rare instances nowadays that you pay for something and you have full faith that the other side is doing what they say they're going to do, but you have no way to prove it. Yeah, it's true. Uh, especially on the social media side, you, you can, it, it's all, everything that's happening is behind the scenes. So you can only hope that you get whatever it is that you're trying to get out of the the campaign. So if you're trying to get clicks to a site, if you're trying to get um, contacts, if you're trying to get leads, you can only hope that there's something that you can measure to, you know, ensure that you got whatever it is that you're trying to get out of that campaign. Yeah, and that's that's another strange thing, right? Like when you do a sponsor post, do you want more engagement or clicks to your website? And I'm like... Right the fuck does that mean <laughs> they're doing it based on the behavior of that person right if that person is a clicker meaning they like to visit every website that they click on that's who's going to see that yeah if your guy is a liker like i used to be a liker i'm not a liker anymore because now everybody else sees what you like and you don't like All right. and so i don't really need everyone on my facebook <laughs> to see like the eccentric stuff that sometimes i like so i just like it in my mind but if somebody's like a serial liker then that's the person that sees the post if you select that you want more engagement it's kind of weird because none of those two people are looking for a house yeah it's true that's something also that i'm i'm working with uh i'm actually meeting with somebody tomorrow after the master class in orlando to uh talk about social media and what we can do to provide something again it has to be effective so there's i want to provide some kind of a social media marketing service to our customers for all the listings we have so much volume we have um, so whatever we can do to help our customers, again, increase their brand exposure, it's, it goes both ways. The more listings our customers get, hopefully the more shoots that we get. Of course. So that's ultimately the, the unless they get too big and hire their own photographers and cut you off. <laughs> I know <laughs> Well, that happens, but it's, uh, there's enough out there though, that I'd like to think that, you know, we'll still be, but you're right. That, that certainly does happen now. But, but that's the thing when um, really the whole business was sort of designed that I want to make our customers look as good as possible so we can get so so they can basically take the media that we provide them and leverage more media from it. So ultimately, we're providing them with media that they can then present at their listing. This is what you know, at their uh, listing presentation, show their listing presentation. This is what we did for our last three, four listings. And this is what we'll do for you. And we hope that it's over the top enough that they'll get more listings and leverage more listings out of it. You guys have obviously um, gone photography, video, drone. Um, are you, are, is there any other areas of marketing within real estate that interest you? Any printed media or? I'm not, well, I'm not as interested in the print media side and, uh, I mean, I, I think that there's an effectiveness there, but again, I don't, I would have to study and right. find out really what the most effective way to, um, to deliver and distribute the print media is before I did anything on that end. Right. Uh, but you know, on, on the, on the video side and the, just the digital media side, there are, I think there's a lot of different things that, um, that we can do to help agents, uh, become community experts that's something that we, I was at rebar at the, um, at the Florida association of realtor yep. expo. And there was, a. uh, how long did it take you to get the shuttle to the, Oh, I got lucky. I parked the day before I parked, uh, right in front. So my van oh, with man. the logo was right there. And then we actually got, we stayed there. We ne st next year, I got to go with the board design. Yeah. You got to hire me for a day. <laughs> that was a nightmare. I did hear about the shuttle and then the lines getting into the expo hall. Oh yeah. That wasn't cool. Yeah. That's the, the last thing that we want. So we paid good money. We had two booths there actually. And, um, we, you know, you don't want people walking around the expo hall that are, that are angry after waiting in line for an hour and a half and then being on a sweaty shuttle bus. Well, I, I got to the expo 
And my plan was to be there for two and a half, three hours. So I think that's all I can digest on, on one bite. But it took like 35, 40 minutes to get, it took like 25 minutes to go to the parking garage because you got to the hotel and then it diverted you. Then it took like, you know, whatever amount of time to get the shuttle and then the shuttle to get to the place. And then when you got to the place, it was over an hour line that I did you know, waiting to get our credentials to be able to go in. And so by the time I got in, I was like, well, I got 20 minutes left. I guess I'm coming back tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I was disappointed with the, uh, with the line. I don't, has it been like that every single year? Uh, this year was that bad like that. And last year was the same. Okay. I don't know about any other, other year before that, because I haven't been. I had heard that they were going to do this year at the Orlando Convention Center, but then um, it was at Rosen Shingle. I assume eventually they're going to move it to a larger venue. I, I, I mean, they make enough money, so they, <laughs> they definitely they should. Uh, but I don't, I don't, I don't want to go on a, like I, I kind of cut you off there, but um, you were saying that you're going different directions with video. Well, yeah. I mean, so different facets of marketing. Uh, something that I learned at, uh, well, something that I learned about and, and sort of have heard about this trend is becoming a community expert uh, and using video. Kathy. You, Kathy's great at it. Um, Ken Posick is another one who's. Wendy Stewart. Uh, it's getting out in the community. Yeah, Wendy, awesome. Getting out in the community and actually talking to people in the community. And that, I think on video, that's a great way to become a community expert. It helps with SEO. It helps just with brand exposure. So there's some things that we want to formulate on that end as well to um, to kind of uh, help agents increase their brand. Something that I really want to work on, and you, I had asked you a question in the in a group the other day, is pre marketing on listings. One of the things that we have a, a huge database of is like today we have a, dozens of shoots, dozens of properties that we're photographing that are going to be on the market within, uh, you know, 24, 48, 72 hours. Everybody has different uh, things that they have to do and different timelines. But we have a huge database of these properties that are going to be on the market. And there's obviously value there. But it's finding a way to work with the, you know, within the constraints of the MLS guidelines. Yep. to make Which that they data. just clamped on that significantly. Yeah, the coming soon stuff just got clamped down. And again, one of those things in the boards, there's people really, really upset about the new guy. And I was like, I can't believe they're doing this like this damn sheet of paper. You got to get the sellers to. It happened for a reason. And it happened because people were abusing it because you have a lot of people that are taking listings, putting them on Zillow directly because Zillow. People think Zillow sometimes is just a database feed. Like it's a, da it's a database that gets fed from the MLSs, but that's not true. As an agent, I can input a listing in Zillow without it being in the MLS. And a lot of agents are doing that and keeping the properties off market so that they can double dip the deal. They're not doing that for the seller's best interest. There's no way any human on this planet is going to convince me that keeping the property off of the MLS is best for the seller because it's not. Right. It's economics. More eyeballs on the property means more demand, which it's a good thing for you if you're trying to sell something. So they were doing that and keeping properties on the market indefinitely. I just had some knucklehead call me about a property of mine let me, let me rephrase this. He didn't call me about a property of mine. He, I, I contacted him because I'm listing a house in the same neighborhood. And so then he called me about the house that I'm listing because I left him a voicemail. And then I looked at his list. He's like, yeah, I have this listing here. And I'm like, yeah, my seller told me you have a listing there. All he has is a sign on the property on Zillow. I mean, he's had it on Zillow for over a month and a half off of the MLS. Wow. And all he's doing is taking those sweet calls because if you call him as an agent and you say, hey, Mr. Shady Realtor, um, I have a buyer interested on this property. Can you show it to me? He will be like, yeah, no, it's it's not on the market yet. Mm -mm. But if a, a consumer calls him and says, hey, can you show me the property? He's like, yeah, sure thing. Let's go wow. ahead and show you the property. So that's why those rules came in, because there's a lot of people inputting properties on this, um, in, on this systems, not in the MLS, which means they're not obligated to co cooperate with other agents. And so it just, 
which by the way, that's actually not true, but on the surface level, it's very difficult to enforce cooperation if your property is only on Zillow and not on the MLS. So right. that's why those guidelines came about. And that's why, you know, I know you talked about it before. You have this database of properties that are coming on the market soon. And, and someone much smarter than me has to try to figure out what to do with that. Because yeah. um, I, I, I don't see of a way to do anything with it that is not going to have be a double edged sword. Right. Um, and it is valuable from a buyer's it's, it's perspective. It's hugely valuable, hugely valuable. It's great when, when you're a buyer. When, you know, I was a buyer last year, and, and to, to have some idea as to what was coming, then, then I knew, okay, well, let's, let's see, you know, let's take a look at that property once it's on the market. Uh, I, I wasn't exposed to anything that was uh, unscrupulous, but right. I do understand what you're saying. But as a buyer, yeah, it was great to know, to have some insight on that pre-market data, to know what's coming, you know, and even as a photographer, sometimes there was a couple listings that are a couple of shoots that we would do in the area that we were kind of looking. And it was nice to know, oh, you know, we got sort of a sneak peek. But, right. But again, it's it is something that I feel like there's there's something there. There's some value there, but it does need to be um, it needs to be uh, outlined in a way that can avoid those unscrupulous people from taking advantage of the sellers ultimately. Yeah. I mean, and the sellers could benefit from it if it was framed properly. Cause I think, I think there is a way to tell a seller, Hey, if we leave the property off of the MLS, I can give you a, you know, a one and a half percent basis point reduction on the commission if I'm able to procure a buyer during that time, because it means I'm going to have both sides of the transaction. And so would you like for me to try to leave the property of the MLS and attempt that approach for the next two weeks? And then we go to the MLS live, or would you just want to go to the MLS? So the problems in our industry always stem from lack of transparency, in my opinion, like when you look at the root and cause of the issues is lack of transparency. But I don't think there's many agents framing it that way. I think there is agents just saying, hey, we're going to, property's going to be in the MLS in two weeks from now because the photographer is busy this week and he'll, he'll be here next week on Tuesday. And then it takes them four days to deliver the pictures to me. And then when they deliver the pictures to me, then I'm going to give that to my admin department and they have 48 hours to input in the MLS. So around about wait 10 to 14 days, the property's going to be off the market and the seller doesn't know better. So the seller goes, okay. So what they did now with this new form is they spelled out to the seller what they're being off the market means. It's like, you understand that when you're off the market, you, people are not looking at your house. Check. Do you understand that this is prevents your house from being looked at by the people that are right now shopping for homes? Check. So it gives this, it provides transparency that agents were obviously not providing by and large. Yeah. So and that does bring up a question now if if there's if you have a listing and it's it's coming soon is it, you you're not going to have the photos and video back for 4 days and you post on Facebook I've got this listing coming soon is that okay it's especially with the new form now there's a gray area because in one of the groups in Facebook if you read verbatim what the form says the form says you can market the listing however you want, so long as you have this form signed by the seller where the seller acknowledges they're going to be off of the MLS for a preconceived amount of time. So as long as the seller says, it's okay to leave my property of the MLS for the next two weeks, or it's a date that you fill in until October 1st, then you are okay by posting it on Facebook. You're okay. You can post it everywhere. The problem is a lot of people were doing that without having the seller sign the previous form and the previous form was was a half a page form that was not very um, enlightening in terms of content so they made it now a two-page form it requires like six initials by the seller on this line items where the seller acknowledges all of the things that are not happening by leaving their property off of the mls so you know to to answer your point someone can do that and post it on facebook before it goes on the mls for as long as they want, so long as, and by the way, this is not advice, I'm not an attorney, um, so long as they have that form signed with the proper date on in there. 
And is that form like a, is that part of what you do on every listing? I do. And I've been doing it for years. Okay. But most agents don't, which I, I think that's why they, some agents kind of like had a knee jerk reaction to it because it's like, I don't, you know, it's a $2,000 automatic fine, right? 2,500 bucks. Yeah. <laughs> that's huge. What the other reason they, it's different now than it was before. And I think this is the thing that really chaps people's butt is before you used to have the form signed. Now you have to have it signed and uploaded into the MLS. Big difference. That yeah. second step of having the form uploaded into the MLS is a big difference because now it, it it provides an additional check and balance to the fact that you filled out the form. Because before, um, if I recall correctly, what would have happened is someone would have had to write you out and they would have asked you for the form. And, you know, it was like a... It was just a non-practical process that was non-verifiable by any real practical means. Like the boards are busy enough. They are not going to be policing this thing. Um, but now you have to upload it. So now it's going to be really easy. Someone is going to submit a complaint like, hey, Mario has this coming soon listing in 123 Main Street. And the MLS is going to go like, Brr, let's go look at 123 Main Street. Oh, yep. Mario uploaded the right form. He's fine. But that was not the way that it was before. So the checks and balances were not there. So, and without that form, a Facebook post could be a violation. Right, because, and the form, the, the thing that gets strange is, which is the part where there's apparently some disagreement with, between what the form says and the advice some folks have been getting from the legal hotline. is the form says you have... 48 hours from the moment the listing is signed to upload the listing into the MLS. If it's going to take any longer than 48 hours, you have to have this form signed. Okay. The disagreement or, or the conflict comes, people have called the legal hotline and the legal hotline has said it's not from the time the listing was signed. It's from the time that you started inputting the property in the MLS. Because a lot of people start inputting the property in the MLS today and then they enter all of the data today and then tomorrow they may do the realtor remarks and then they get the pictures the next day. Okay. And so, you know, you can, it take, it can take sometimes some people, I don't know who they are, but apparently some people <laughs> multiple days to enter a property in the MLS. And so that the question was, you know, is it from the time of signature and the listing agreement or is it from the time that you started entering the property in, in the MLS? Either which way I get assigned on every listing. Um, and either which way, I don't think it's a big ask or all things consider. And it is my thought that in the grand scheme of things, it's a minor nuisance to help the industry become a little more transparent about what we do, yeah. because this was not something that came out of the blue. Hardly ever things in our industry happen because some figurehead just points down and says, you guys got to do this now. Right. This was the result of committee meetings in the state of Florida between um, members of the boards of different real, real estate associations and um, different brokers and all production levels. And they came up with this thing. So obviously there was some sort of a grievance that merited all this process taking place. Yeah. Uh, George Philbeck was on your show mm -hmm. and um, something that he had said too. another great takeaway. I love all the takeaways with all the people that are on your show. I'm glad you're listening. At least one person is. <laughs> um, he had said even at his peak, 25 people he had working with him on his team and a uh, thousand properties a year. Every day he was finding things to tweak and improve. And I think that, you know, the pre-market, it's one of those things you look at, how can what can we do within the framework that exists to tweak and provide as much exposure to uh, our sellers? You know, from a real from a real estate agent perspective, from my perspective, it's the same thing. I want to look at what we do, the value that we provide. How much? Uh, what can we do within the framework that exists? Uh, and that's kind of why I'm asking so many questions on the pre market side because yeah. I legitimately do want to make sure that our customers are doing the right thing. All the agents that we work with. So we work with a ton of new agents um, and it's not our job necessarily to uh, educate our, the, our customers. But if I have the ability to provide some framework or, you know, some something that can enable them to uh, take advantage without getting in trouble, um, then I'll always do that. Text text labels on photos. Yeah, I think I think one of the things that, you know, you can't put the cart before the horse. And I think the biggest 
value you can provide an agent is going to be on helping them get that listing. And so focusing a little bit on that time between them getting the listing appointment and actually showing up at the listing appointment. I do this thing, which is, um, I do it a lot when I train people to work with buyers and it's kind of like, I call it the curve of emotions. And it's basically, I draw out in a whiteboard and I should probably do this in camera at some point where it basically just kind of shows the stages of the transaction and where the emotions of people are. And so that you should be aware of this. So you know to deliver them bad news when there are peak highs and deliver them good news at peak lows to try to make those peaks and valleys less steep and make them you know, as flat as possible. That's brilliant, by the way. And thank you. <laughs> I, I've done that for years. Um, and there's a couple of things that I've done as far as like side projects. And um, that's one that I, that I really need to spend more time on. But um, there's the same thing for sellers. The sellers go through the same peak and valley of emotions. And so I think there is a way for, for a media company in this case to be able to provide something between the time that you hang up the phone for that appoint, to set that appointment and the time of that appointment. Because what happens in that time, it's all lows. People right. are not going on a high. When you call someone and make up an appointment to sell your home, you might have been here, but then it's a steep drop off until the day you get that appointment, until that appointment. And what happens often enough during, often enough to merit um, an antidote during that time is that's where seller remorse comes in and they cancel the appointment. I see. So, if you find a way to keep the emotions a little more level between the time they hang up the phone and the time you show up to the listing appointment, I think that would be of high value to all agents of all production levels, because this is someone that everyone's dealing with at some point or another. And listen, that might be a program where an agent can share with you like, hey, we have a listing appointment at this property next week. You know, this is the address and this is, you know, their... Um, this is the address or the email or whatever, and that you go and you say, okay, great. I'm going to send those people an independent pre-listing packet from me as a photographer and a videographer so that they know who you're working with. And it just gives additional credence to that agent. And so I think that's a valuable, that would be a valuable tool for, for agents because a lot of us, We'll do a pre-listing packet on an email or a pre-CMA that we send an email or on the mail. But if that person then is checking their mail where you're only getting bad news, all the bills and everything else, and there's this beautiful divorce designs, you know, like, you know, two or three page pamphlet that sh shows them like, hey, this is what your house may look like. This is, you know, this is some pictures that we've done in the past, specifically if it's branded with that agent in mind, yep. where you have the logo for that agent and, and, and it says, hey, you know, the Denny's group says they have an appointment at 123 Main Street. Once they are completed with the listing paperwork, we'll be photo photographing your house. These are some things that you should know before we show up to your home. Yeah, yeah. You know, so someone will go from a low to a high at that point, I think, because they're going to gain confidence that they made the right decision with the agent. Right. One of the things that I think affects most sellers the most emotionally is knowing whether they made the right decision or not when they pick an agent, because they truly don't. So anything that you can do to validate their decision or let them know that they made the right decision, that confirms the decision that they made when they picked this specific agent I think it's a it's a great value and it's going to keep them happier through the process, at least to get them to that point of not canceling the listing appointment. And then there is something else to talk about when you get to the listing appointment. It's going to be like, oh, man, that big guy sent me this thing man, it looked great. You know, now the agent does, doesn't have to spend 10 minutes talking about the professional photographer that they're going to bring out because it's going to be like, hey, did Vic send you the package? He right. did, didn't he? Yep. Yep. That's my guy. That's who we're working with. And it sets them apart because if they're meeting with two other agents, unless they're working with divorce designs, which that could get tricky, <laughs> then, um, then, you know, it completely sets you apart. Yeah. I like that. The, the gears are spinning right now. There's, I've got some ideas there. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's the way that I conduct business is wholeheartedly from beginning to end. 
I just I just try to figure out where people are in their emotions and I have the appropriate response to that emotion. And empathy is the thing sometimes, but most times it's not. Most times, you know, empathy is always a good idea. But what I'm saying is when people are have when they're feeling remorseful, I'm, I don't necessarily want to empathize with that feeling. I want to I want to logically and factually tell them why maybe that's unfounded or maybe why it's logical for them to feel that way, but we have ways to mitigate it. Right. Because here's the other thing that sellers want to hear about is data. And if you were to send a part of that pre-listing packet, for example, if you picked, if you picked your last 100 shoots and you pull the data from the MLS and figure out the days on the market on that, I will bet you a thousand dollars that it's lower than the days on the market. There are going to be lower than um, the standard for the MLS. Yeah. Very easy stat to pull. So if you did that and you did that versus the MLS, part of that can say, hey, when we use, when the VOR photography is involved in the, in the mix, regardless of who the agent is, we are, we are the days on the market for your home are going to be less. Yeah. Um, you know, list to sales price. Also an important thing, because here's the thing that we, you know, there's causation and correlation. The correlation is people that are using the board designs, for the most part, I think, are not knucklehead agents. They know what they're doing for the most part, I would like to think, because they're taking that extra step of hiring a professional to do this. Yeah. And partly because the bar in the industry is so low, the standard is so low, it's easy to say, if you use DeVore design days on the market or less, if you use DeVore designs, your list to sales price is less. Yep. So there's a lot of meaningful data that you can provide to someone that's thinking about selling their home to validate the decision that a listing agent made when choosing you to do the marketing for the house. Yeah, it's true. I mean, and, and there is a lot of data out there too that, uh, that, does correspond to that. But, but yeah, I, I know what you're saying in terms of, of providing that, uh, that experience. And again, you talk about experience, another takeaway, Amanda Douglas, the experience, the customer experience, it's all part of that. It's all related to that same, uh, that same, you know, general kind of philosophy of, uh, and, and that is something I, that's a, that's a fantastic concept. Um, you had mentioned not to, to spin around in a circle too much. You Go had mentioned it. virtual staging. Mm -hmm. You weren't a fan of it. What are some Sucks. of the, <laughs> tell me, tell me about it. I, obviously we provide virtual staging. Now I definitely s understand the, there's a huge difference between walking into a property that is professionally staged. Joseph Sip, you know, there's, there's some really talented stagers in our market. Um, I only know Joseph Sip. I don't know any others. So he, I use, he's that, great. that's the one that I use a singular for when people are like, there's great stagers. I know one great stager. Yeah. yeah. I don't, I haven't met the others. I'm sure there is. Um, but, but you know, there's definitely a difference between uh, seeing staged photos and walking into a vacant house and then walking into a house that is staged. But I, I'd like to know your point of view, your perspective, your philosophy on the virtual staging. I think there's a time and a place for it. And generally that place is going to be homes that are too, that are either specific architectural types that are very difficult to conceptualize for the majority of people, meaning rooms with odd shapes, um, weird angles, you know, because people walk into it and they're like, where the hell do you put the bed? Right. But I think if a home is uh, like a, a normal home, uh, your average 2,500 square foot house, you know, the bedroom is pretty, pretty self-explanatory where the bed's going to go. That doesn't need to be virtually staged. And what happens a lot of times with virtual staging is when people go to the house, it's a letdown. And so back to that emotional curve of people. When they see the home in the MLS for the first time or in Zillow, and there's all these beautifully virtually staged pictures, they fall in love with something. When they get to the date, the guy has another 40 pounds on him. He's now bald and he, you know, like he doesn't look like he did on the profile picture. <laughs> and just like it would work if it was a date, yep. there is an unavoidable level of disappointment that yeah. brings them down. The problem with that is 
90% of the time for a successful transaction, the person has to fall in love the second they walk through the door. Yep. So if you didn't make that happen, if the virtual staging failed to deliver, you created an obstacle for that experience to be delivered for that buyer, now you're having to overcome an additional emotion that you didn't have to overcome originally. So if a home, you know, very large homes, you know, six, 7,000 square foot, you don't even know where to begin because, they, you know, they have all these rooms that you could make it into a theater or you could make it into an office or you could whatever, you sure. know. Then something like that, yes, I think I think there's a time and a place where it's very valuable for, for those things. And more importantly, I think in a lot of homes, the best use of virtual staging is actually to show side-by-side -side pictures so that people are not falling for the idea that this may be the way this house actually looks right um more so that you're presenting an idea as to how you could how, how things could be laid out correct how it could look correct but that's not the way that uh, most agents are using it the way that i see it in the mls i see in the mls a front picture and then i see 23 pictures that have been virtually staged back to back and yeah there's a disclaimer sometimes somewhere mm -hmm. some place that says that the house is being virtually staged and that's all wonderful but what if that buyer doesn't get to that? What if that doesn't, what if that's the line that's in their phone kind of like hidden in the bottom? Like, you know, you can't expect people to read it. And so I've, in my experience working with buyers, it's become more of something that I have to overcome. That's something that helps the transaction. Um, so that's kind of my thoughts on it. That's why I don't like it a whole lot. Yeah, I think there is specifically like, listen, if you have a really high end listing, I think that you do this, especially with the MLS not having the constraint on pictures that they did before, like it was first like 12 and then it went to 25 or whatever. Yep. And then, you know, now we can go a lot more than that. You can do the side by side, N not side by side on the same picture, which some agents do that. Don't do that. That's stupid. Don't <sighs> do that. You do one picture of the room and then the next picture is the room staged. Yep. And so it becomes obvious to the person viewing the house what's happening here. That's a good idea. And then when you get to the house, the staged pictures, you print them and you put them on a stencil yeah. on those rooms so that people have an idea of what that looks like. So now it's not complete disappointment. Now you can put the pieces of the puzzle together. Yeah. But that's the part that I think requires um, just a little extra nuance for people. And... You know, I think one of the problems is the way that listing agents sometimes are talking with the sellers about this. Like, hey, just so you know, our photographer can do virtual staging. We right. can do virtual staging. Virtual staging is the bomb. And the seller goes, shit, shit, shit. Fucking <laughs> stage it. Virtually stage it. Stage everything. Put shit on the pantry. And, and there isn't a conversation taking place about it. Because when I talk to my sellers, the conversation is, is the house going to be vacant? And they say, yes. This is, or everyone always asks, do you think that's going to hurt the property? And I say, well, there's two types of people. There's the type of people that are prefer to see a vacant because they want to visualize their own stuff in there. And there's people that prefer to see it furnished because they don't have the ability to picture their own stuff in there. We don't know which one is going to fall in love for your house. So, you know, whatever the situation is, we just have to be optimistic about the outcome. Right. I said, however, if it's going to be vacant, one of the things that we can do is we can virtually stage some of the rooms or we can virtually stage every room and show them what it may look like if it's being furnished in a specific way, right? but also showing it vacant. In and case I think you that's get a, that buyer. If and, you have uh, that buyer that needs the visualization to... And I think that's the truly the best of both worlds. Yeah. there's So Tordrop is a sister company of DeVore Design. Tordrop does virtual staging. We do photo editing. And uh, the one of the, the best uses of virtual staging that I found as a photographer is often when the sellers are in that process of listing their house, sometimes they'll use a room to stage like boxes and stuff. And we can do what we call digital declutter. Um, and that's when I advocate for that in that instance where right. you want to show a particular space, but at the time of photography, it's filled with boxes or it's, it's a mess and we can actually, you know, declutter it. Now you, we would never go as far as to change the actual, there's, there are MLS um, guidelines that, you know, make it like th these, these are guidelines that are very clear as to what you can and cannot do 
with uh, photo editing and virtual staging. I mean, both of those things. You can't, you know, patch up holes in walls. You can't, there's things that you can't do. Even, I mean, even when it comes to grass, you can, we get that request all the time. And in, in Florida, our grass can be brown one week and green the next. I mean, it definitely changes, but it's one of the things we have to be careful with. And when customers ask us, you know, can you do a grass replacement in this part of the grass? I always tell them we can, but be aware that there, there could be problems if we had one of our customers one time had a, uh, that their seller had a shed in the backyard. They moved the shed. You had this huge, just dirt spot in mm-hmm. their backyard. And the seller told the listing agent that they were going to put grass back there, that they were going to sod it. So the listing agent told us to do grass replacement over the dirt. So we did grass replacement. It turns out the seller did, they seeded it. They didn't do, they didn't sod it. Oh, geez. On top of that, it was sold sight unseen. Oh. So now your sellers are at the property wondering why half the backyard is dirt. And um, the buyers rather. The buyers, I'm sorry. The buyers, so it created a problem. It created a. Of course. Um, luckily the listing agent was able to, I don't know exactly what he, he did. But uh, he went to Lowe's and he got four, eight pieces of grass and threw them down. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it cost money. I mean, it, yeah. it was a real problem. And that was, I was glad that the agent told me about that because now that's something I can share with people also that we have to be careful when, you know, to not misrepresent the property. That's what it comes down to is not misrepresenting the property. And the same thing goes with virtual staging. You, I've seen virtual staging where people, will uh, put smaller furniture in a, in what's already a small room to make or a fireplace. (laughs) Oh yeah. Fireplaces we have to be careful with because sometimes, so when it comes to fireplaces, even we try to do fireplace replacements, but our photographers will often ask the listing agent, does this fireplace work or not? Because sometimes people have fireplaces. I haven't lit this thing in six, seven years. Right. So we don't want to put a fake fire in the fireplace. If, the thing, you know, if we don't know that it's going to work. So that's another one of those examples of, um, you know, sky replacements. There's, there's certain things that we can do. Clouds, they, you know, we have sunny skies, we have cloudy skies. Right, right, right. Um, Properties look better with blue skies over them instead of rain. Right. Um, So there's things like that that we can do and, uh, and not get in any trouble. And, um, but yeah, we have to definitely watch ourselves on the misrepresentation. Uh, Then another thing too that i want to bring up is is licensing photo licensing I've oh yes that was my next good we good. were going there next we were going there next because man do some photographers got butt hurt about that yeah so did you get butt hurt my no when it comes down <laughs> when it comes to licensing like I, I the way that i look at licensing first of all i i look at what we're providing we're providing a service to to provide photos, but you know, it's, it's a service, the media that we provide, I, I want it to always lead to, um, to more listings. I want it to, to leverage more listings for the seller or for the agent and for us to get more shoots, but I'm not going to ever make licensing a hurdle between us and our customers. I'm clipping this portion and this is going to be a one minute clip. So just, just letting you know. Um, I am probably different than most photographers when it comes to licensing. I, um, I don't, I, I'm not going to make it a hassle to, to do business. What's your, what's, tell me, share your philosophy on licensing, a photo licensing, media licensing. We're going to have general. to switch sides here. You're asking me too many questions. <laughs> um, I think the posture of some photographers have, has been absolutely absurd um, when it comes to the licensing thing, because... It's got to figure out how to say this to sound like less of a dick than I I think I agree with you. There's art. And so if you're a photographer that does photography as you know, you do, you take pictures and you sell them on a gallery or you show them in a gallery. I don't think you're the same as the guy that's taking pictures for me to put in the MLS. And I don't mean that in a derogatory way because I believe Big Divorce makes a lot more money than the guys that are putting their pictures on a gallery. So I don't mean that in a derogatory way at all. There's a term for it. It's called disposable media. Right. And so to be all apprehensive 
about it and say, well, you know, they're going to have to pay me thousands of dollars to be to give this worldwide irrevocable licensing right for this media. I think that's just trash. That's just garbage. Like that's just a bad, um, that that's a bad thing to be putting out there because no real estate agent is going to pay you that first. Second of all, it tells me that you are not nuanced enough to understand not only what you're doing, but what we are doing as real estate agents. And also there's a level of paranoia that I, I'm paranoid to a certain point about a lot of things, but there's a level of paranoia that I just can't handle. I can't deal with it. I, I just, I shut down. And that's one where I'm like, yeah, well, cause now people are going to pull your pictures from Google and they're going to use it for brochures on their own. Ha I'm like, you know how many houses there is out there? And even if they do, like, do you think a license? You think like not checking that box, you know, you think that's going to change that. And you're going to know that the guy in, you know, San Bernardino, California, used your picture. How are you going to know that? Right. How, how are you planning yeah. to trace this? Like, what are you doing here? Why are you getting so upset about this? Are you, do you just want to start an argument on Facebook or social media or... Are you generally upset about this? And if you're upset about it, what what is? I haven't heard a rational fear from a photographer that I can go like, huh, that makes sense. I have colleagues that tell me, and none none local, but uh, I have out of the area colleagues that have told me that they make money from relicensing photos, and I would never think of doing that. If you pay me to do a shoot for you and that listing expires, I am not going to resell the photos that I took for you that you paid me for to another agent that's competing with you. I would yeah. never think of it. Yeah, and it is just an absurd proposition. It really is an absurd proposition. The problem, again, I've used the word nuance like 50 times today and I'm going to keep using it because it's the thing that really likes the most. It's critical thinking. I, I used that one a lot with when I did the podcast with Aaron. But the problem is understand why the rule was created, where it came from and the need for it. And then you are free to come up with whatever, you know, your feelings are or conclusions are on it. This came up because of a much more real fear which is uh, dozens of lawsuits being levied on the mls's at a local level for use for distributing pictures which we know are get distributed to thousands of websites mm -hmm. hundreds if not thousands of websites so this was a, a necessary measure that they had to put in place so that there isn't all these lawsuits flying in their face right you know like yep what do you want them to do you know, like that's media is such as media, internet, um, social media. It's all such a new world. Like the internet has been around in mass level for 20 years. That's it. We've had smartphones. The first iPhone was what, 2007? Yes. Yep. 2007. 2007. So we've had that for a little over 10 years. And we're expecting the MLS boards and we're expecting everyone to just know what to do. We're expecting all the laws to be here and caught up tomorrow. We're expecting everything to be figured out. It doesn't work that way. And then it'll change tomorrow. And then it'll change tomorrow. So get your head out of your ass. It doesn't change anything for you. You were getting paid to take pictures for a home to be sold. Now, the, now you're just given the licensing for that picture to basically leave your domain so you can't resell it again. Yep. Like you said... A lot of photographers don't even wouldn't do that from an ethical standpoint. And I'm glad to hear you are one of those people. I would never do business with a photographer that would sell those pictures to another agent. That would be a deal breaker for me. It's terrible customer service. Of course it is. Of course it is. It's customer, uh, terrible business and customer service because guess what happens if you don't sell them the pictures? You just get another shoot. That's the way we look at it. So let's say some, so let's say that that does happen. The listing expires and another agent wants the media. We'll go to the first agent and say, this agent is interested. Sometimes there's deals that get made and we're fine with it. We don't, we just, at the end of the day, we don't want your media being used by somebody that you didn't give permission to. And we don't care what you, we, we do care what you do with the media. We care. We want you to use the media to become successful. We want you to use the media to sell the listing. But yeah, we've never gotten into, into a dispute about licensing ever. Yeah. I mean, 
some people are in business for one thing and then they get they let a distraction take their business to be something else that it was not what it was intended to be. I never heard anyone ever in all my years in real estate talk about licensing of pictures until the MLS made people click that box. And then the MLS made people click that box and it became like this storm, you know, and, and I just didn't understand it. And I just, and I, and I'm sure someone, you know, like if I was to play devil's advocate on my own position, someone would say, I just don't understand. I just don't understand that they're artists. I just don't understand that, you know, this, this, this is a slippery slope for bigger evils to calm down. Possibly. I mean, I just, it's just an opinion. I don't, I don't like it. I don't, I don't like this overzealousness over licensing of pictures of boxes. And real estate photographers would hate the way I'm talking right now mm -hmm. because I, again, it's so transparency. We had talked, you'd made, briefly mentioned transparency, transparency, licensing should be part of that transparency. Just generally not, you know, um, not getting into business with somebody providing photos and then hoping that they do something wrong so you can find them or so you can try to send them a big bill if they put it on a billboard. I love, there's, there's been a couple customers that have used our photos on billboards. I love it. I don't charge them for it. I think it's awesome. I think yeah. it's great. Yeah. I, I listen, I really like that about you. I really like that about the way that you guys do business because we have enough external pressure in our business. And by the way, this is the strongest part of this whole conversation for me. I have enough pressure to deal with. I got to deal with I buyers. I got to deal with discount brokerages. I got to deal with brokerages, brokers that are trying to take, you know, chunks of commissions. I got to deal with enough external pressure on my business for me to now have to also be an advocate for myself to be able to deal with internal pressure because my photographer feels like I shouldn't click the box of the licensing. Right. And then he says that there's going to be like if I click that and he didn't authorize me to click that or she didn't authorize me to click that, then, you know, I'm going to get some sort of, uh, um, you know, demand letter or some litigious action against me. Yeah. No, 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 <laughs> no, no, no. We're not going to be doing that. We're not going to be doing that. I'm going to be working with people who allow me to move freely and who provide me an advantage against external pressures, not people that give me headaches internally. Like that's just not going to work. That's part of the divorce design concept from the beginning too, is transparency. We, all of our prices are right on our website. That's something a lot of real estate photographers don't, some do, some do, some don't. But, um, I would say about half of real estate photographers, they don't put their prices out there. And I understand that you've got some houses that are huge, some houses that are small, but I can tell you, we've photographed thousands of houses. The average house that we photographed is 2,500 square feet. It's three and a half bedrooms and it's two and a half bathrooms. That is the average house. So you know you're going to have some smaller. You know you're going to have some larger. Yeah. You, you got to be able to go hungry one day and have leftovers the next day. Every business makes that calculus yep. and they try to fall somewhere in between that doesn't hinder their ability to be in the marketplace and keeps them profitable. But to your point, this idea it happens not just in photography, it happens in the inspection business as well. Um, it happens in a lot of different things that have to do with, with our industry where people don't want to quote a price up front. And I'm like, you know what? It's just not the way that's going to work. When I do my projections for the year, I assume that on the buyer side, some listings are going to pay 3%, some are going to pay 2.5%, some are going to pay 2%, some, I just had one at 3.5%, which I'm super excited <laughs> about. Um, you know, but there's, you have to know that that's the reality, the reality of the industry is all these things are fluctuated, all these things change, and to your point, there's going to be, you know, a 1400 square foot house that you knock out in 20 minutes or 30 minutes, which is going to be, you know, where you're going to have leftovers. And then sometimes you, you know, maybe your threshold is up to 3000 square feet and you're going to have a 2900 square foot house that has 17 bedrooms and all these bathrooms and stuff. And that one's going to eat up half of your day and you lost money on that one. And, but you just hope at the end of the year, you're on a net positive. Yep. And you have growth and that uh, you can continue doing it the next year. Yeah, that's it. You hit those averages and you, you kind of know that they're, you know, you're going to have those, 
those days that are fast and you, you get through a bunch of properties and some, some days, days are 28. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. um, yeah, on our pricing side, the only limitations that we have are on our really cheap packages that are only like 10 to 15 photos. And the reason that I've limited, uh, square footage on those packages, one reason it's because sometimes we had customers that would order, uh, the cheapest 10 to 15 photo package for a 4,000 square foot house and then wonder why they didn't get every single bedroom, every single bathroom, three shots of the pool, three shots of the kitchen. Well, we couldn't, we couldn't. So we had to limit ourselves on those smaller packages, but otherwise we, we don't do square footage limitations or surcharges or we, there's just no reason because of what I said, because of what exactly what you said, those averages, they're there. We know what the average house is going to be. We're all dealing with those same averages. Well, and and, and for a listing agent, it's going to be tougher. Like sometimes I'm sitting with a seller and the seller has, um, the seller has, you know, a, a particular situation where they might be close to a short sale point or something where, you know, where I'm doing this for, for really cheap. I always say that every year I end up doing at least one or two pro bono deals um, because you just meet someone that it's in a tough spot and it helps to know upfront what your expenses are going to be. Yep. Not having to be like, all right, let me know if I, let me see if I can do that. Let me look. Okay. So it's $25 per bedroom yeah. and then $36 if it has a bathroom, but 40 if it has a shower and a top, you know? So it's like, yep. it's that, that's not a, I can't do business that way. I can't try to figure out my costs on the fly. Like I want to know upfront. I know off the top of my head, this is how much it's going to cost me to get this house life on the market. Yeah. You need predictability. You need to know what it is. I mean, we're all in business together. We're all in business together. We're all aligned with one another. Um, and yeah, as, as whatever way we can work with each other. What's your typical availability look like now for pictures um, on your turnaround time. So Monday, for example, we had three people call that were ready for photos that day. We were able to accommodate them that day. So on, oh, wow. on Monday, we actually had three same day shoots. Uh, typically we can, it just depends on where exactly the property is, but 24 hours of good average. Yeah. Usually next business day, we can get somebody there. Good. Um, do you have, do you do something different for vacant land, people to have vacant land? If you're going to list that, what, what does that look like from your end? We have a $150 aerial package and it includes aerial photos, aerial video. We include a website. We, we produce a, a short video for it and, uh, it's all aerial, but we get shots low. We get shots high. We get shots of the surrounding area. Um, but it's 150 bucks. And I, you know, I know that vacant land is one of those things that sometimes it sits, sometimes it sells. So, right. um, yeah, it seems like a, a cost effective point for, for those types of properties. Yeah. Good. Well, Vic, I think we just broke the record. Yeah. An hour, 27 minutes. We broke the record for the longest episode yet, which I love because it's been a really good conversation. I'm, cool. I'm a talker. You seem to be a talker. So this was fun. Awesome. Well, thank you very, very much. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity, you know, tourdrop.com. That's one of, yeah, the, I was going to tell you, tell people how to get in touch with you. Sure. So, so tourdrop.com, that's our sister company of Devor design that we do. Um, we do photo editing. If you do take your own photos, you should be hiring a professional, but if you do take your own photos, go to tourdrop.com and at least let them edit your photos so we can make them look as good as possible. DevoreDesign.com, uh, we provide, uh, you can go to DevoreDesign.com. That's all of our photography business here in the Metro Orlando area. And uh, we cover Volusia County, Seminole, all the way down to Point Siena, Lakeland. Um, we're going into Brevard County and we'll have coverage in, in Tampa again here shortly. So I appreciate everybody's business. Again, today was a record breaking day for, for our company and I'm uh, happy to spend it here with you, Mario. So thanks a lot. Very good. Thank you, Vic. Thank you.